Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by italki.com. For those of you who haven't heard of italki before, it's a fun, fast, and effective way to learn a language. Yeah, it's actually a language learning platform. So learners and teachers from all over the world sign up and then link up to learn languages. You can find someone that's within your price range, who specializes in the things you want to learn, or even speaks the local dialect you want to learn. If you're learning Spanish, you can find someone from Argentina if you're going to Buenos Aires. <laughs> See, I learned that on italki. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get started today, we've got a special promo going on, and it's promos.com. It's promos.italki.com slash the world wanders and you get your second lesson free after you sign up for your first so get started today hello and welcome to another edition of the world wanders podcast today we are talking about technology and travel and how travel is changing as uh, technology continues to progress and kind of get into also some of the tools we use and how that's changed over the five years that we've been travelers. <laughs> yeah, and so just a quick note before we really dig in. Um, these are all our own opinions and personal experiences. Obviously, every traveler has a different experience within the way that they've traveled. And this is just the progression of how technology has really changed for us personally. Yeah, and so like if you're a really early adapter, you might have been like, wait, what? You were doing that in 2014? <laughs> yeah. You're the yeah. hermits. Yeah. And I mean, we didn't have iPhones back when we first started traveling. iPhones definitely existed in 2011. So if you were somebody who had an iPhone, you might be like, what? You didn't have an iPhone? I guess we were just behind the times, still in BlackBerry mode. But so just so everyone knows, this is not like, you know, the be all end all there's no right or wrong. This is just a sharing of our experiences and how technology has really improved travel for us, I would say. Yeah, it's something that we've been thinking about a lot since we've been over here in Asia. Um, a bit, a big reason for us thinking about this is because we've been riding with Uber so much. And last time we traveled together was in 2014. Uh, we spent six months in South America and we didn't have phones. We weren't buying SIM cards well, we had phones. We weren't using them. So we weren't buying SIM cards. We hadn't really experienced Uber because we'd been living in Calgary, which is such a backwards place that they still don't have Uber right. in 2016. <laughs> yeah, um, which is absolutely crazy since parts of the U.S. are getting automatic or self-driving cars now, which is just absurd that we don't even have it. I mean, most of Canada doesn't even have Uber. Yeah. But so as we've driven around in nice cars in Manila and now Kuala Lumpur, and we're staying in an Airbnb here. We're kind of thinking like, wow, this is like a, a much different world because of these two apps and like the technology behind them. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of brought up like, it's funny because we're not that old, but it's kind of like one of those <laughs> old man kind of things where you're like, wow, back in my day, like <laughs> when we first started traveling, it was a lot different. Yeah. Yeah. And our two of our really good friends, Steve and Julia, they went traveling for a bit in Europe uh, in the spring, this past spring in 2016. And I remember before they left Atlanta, we went for a hike up Stone Mountain, which is like the iconic hike to do in Atlanta. It was one of their last days there. And they were asking me, you know, all these things about cell phones and Google Maps and how we did things traveling. And I was like, oh, well, like the first time we traveled, we just used like guidebooks. And they were like, use guidebook map, like guidebook maps. And I was like, yeah, use guidebook maps. They're like, but how did you not get lost? I'm like, <laughs> we're the same generation. Like, do you not know how to read a map? <laughs> like, <laughs> we're a really cool generation because we were kind of, you know, we were like alive during the time of encyclopedias and paper maps. But then we also grew up in this time where we got to see Google Maps become a thing and really see like the internet take over for all these like archaic ways of doing things. But in 2011, we didn't have cell phones with us. We had Blackberries, like I mentioned before, we left them at home. Um, Ryan had an iPod and I had an iPad. And so oftentimes we would look up like the directions to somewhere on Ryan's like 
iPod and then we would take a screenshot of it and we would go buy that if we didn't have a guidebook. And that's like kind of how we would get around. We would figure out what time a train was. We would go to the bus station via taxi or via bus or via public transit. And we would just like hope that our information was right. <laughs> and I mean, it worked out. Yeah. I, I remember having more issues though, like always having to rely on. Um, so we were still using Hostel World then and we are now as a big way to book hostels. But when you book a hostel on there, the hostel has inputted directions. And so you get in your confirmation email the directions, which I remember distinctly being uh, in Barcelona one time and whoever wrote the ho- directions to the hostel from the train station had broken English. And it was just a confusing mess of like left at red building right over here. <laughs> and then like by the thing, do this. And we were just like so lost. And it's funny because we would put so much thought into like, oh, well, we're at the hostel before we go to the next city. Like, we need to load a map. We need to make sure we have that figured out. And like loading that email as well was a thing because like um, we would use my iPad for that sort of stuff. And I mean, it's always awkward to pull your iPad. I don't have an iPad mini either because this is before the iPad mini was a thing. I have like a clunky like iPad too. So I'd like pull out this clunky thing and like have to load the email. And if I hadn't loaded it before I updated my email, it actually wouldn't even show up if I didn't have any internet. So we just had to like put a lot more thought into getting to and from places without Wi-Fi. I remember I used to make sure my email was also updated because I spent a lot of like train rides responding to friends emails, friends and family. And so I would type the whole email, press send. It obviously wouldn't go through and then it would all just send whenever I got into Wi-Fi next. It's just kind of like I remember telling Steve and Julia this and they were actually laughing at me like as if I was like, you know, the way I would like kind of laugh at my grandma when she told me how she does stuff like did stuff back in the day. And it's so interesting to think about how much technology has changed even over the last five years. Yeah, it's just like a realm of problems that you never have and almost seem ridiculous that you could have had. That like now that we're traveling and we've got unlocked phones, we're just using SIM cards. So we're kind of connected all the time and we're like, oh, yeah, how do we get over there? Cool, let's take an Uber. Um, <laughs> yeah versus like this getting lost and having to ask questions thing and uh and it brings up like a a funny point because there's a lot of comfort value in being connected but you also kind of like lose some of the stuff that was really enjoyable about traveling um maybe not enjoyable in the moment but like overall enjoyable Right. Like the idea of being on a train for like eight hours where nobody can reach you is like kind of nice or spending an entire day exploring without this like, oh, I'm going to like post on my Instagram story or take a Snapchat here. Oh, I just got an email in. Like, let me just sit and deal with this quickly while you're at like the Palace of Versailles. Like that type of thing doesn't happen when you're disconnected from data. Yeah. Like they're one of the the good value adds from travel is like being bored and like there's a value in being disconnected and kind of breaking up some habits that you have when you have Facebook on your phone or whatever like you learn to read you learn to think you learn to be more at peace with yourself because you don't have those distractions and now that it's easier and easier to be connected even while you're traveling you kind of lose that and you have to make a conscious effort to be to to break those habits in a way you didn't before whereas just going traveling would help you break the habits right yeah i remember when we went uh to south america like we both had our iphones but we um, put our plans on hold and we were just on airplane mode the entire time with accessibility to wi-fi i remember feeling like that was such a i don't know such a luxury like i was like oh it's so nice that i like have this iphone that i can take photos on it's so easy to like upload photos to facebook or instagram like it was so much easier to update people on what i was doing just by having that phone even though i wasn't connected do you remember that yeah and and i remember so in 2011 while we were traveling it was fairly common for people to be traveling without a phone of any sort yeah um in 2014 it seemed like a lot quite a few of the people we met were traveling with a phone i remember doing spanish school in buenos aires and a bunch of people we were with had 
Argentinian SIM cards and we were kind of like a little bit of outsiders for not having that. Yeah, like not having a local number was almost kind of weird to a lot of people. Yeah, there. and then now it seems like so far in Asia, it's like everyone has them. And when you get to the airport here, you pull out and in the main lobby of all the airports seems to be like, oh, hey, here's a SIM card. You'll get like 70 million gigs of data for like 15 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so what was your question at the point? I was just saying, like, in 2014, like, just having iPhones, even though they weren't unlocked and having data, like, it felt like such a luxury compared mm-hmm. to the first time that we traveled. Because there are definitely some struggles around, like, we, we listed a couple, but there's definitely struggles when you don't have connection to things, especially when you're trying to get from place to place. And I remember in Europe it not being so bad, but I remember having a lot of uncomfortable situations when we're in Asia because it was uncomfortable to pull my big clunky ipad out in the middle of you know a train station or a bus station or an airport where it's like all of a sudden i've put a target on myself i'm already this like like westerner who's like in weird westerner clothes and i'm like already creating attention then i've pulled out this ipad to like look up how to get to our hostel whereas like when you do it with a phone it's like easier to be discreet it's just like doesn't seem as like big of a deal i guess yeah it's funny you saying that reminds me of how how worried we were about our technology when we were traveling Asia in 2011, and now like we're not we're only a month into it here and we haven't been too many places, but it's it's funny how much the kind of um, like the local scene has changed because now it's like everyone has a smartphone. Right. Like we were in Manila. It's not like the most developed or richest place around, but like, yeah, everyone's got smartphones. Um, yeah, nobody even like pays attention when yeah, you pull out your Yeah, I remember thinking iPhone. like, like in 2011, like, oh, I should be worried about, well, I just had an iPod at the time, so I wasn't worried about that. But your iPad, we were kind of like sketch or in South America, like with my iPhone at some points in time, I'd be like, oh, I don't want to pull this out. Um but yeah, now here, so far, the places we've been, it's like, oh, you know, whatever. I'll carry my iPhone in my pocket. <laughs> like it, I'm worried about pickpockets if we're in a crowd. But uh, other than that, it doesn't like attract attention at all. Yeah. Do you think that's like overall safety of places improving? Or do you think it's just like, you know, the people here have their own gadgets, so they're not really interested in ours? Yeah, I think that's the main thing. Um, I don't know if theft has changed in any way but it's it's just technology is changing for the developed world pretty fast but in the developing world it's just changing so much faster the proliferation and how cheap and um, available things are is just crazy here right yeah we when we were at tbex which was the travel blogging exchange conference that we went to in manila which is the reason why we went to the philippines um, the final keynote was the author of A Thousand Places to Go Before You Die. And she gave us her top 10 places. And she showed a photo from Papua New Guinea of um, a tribal man. And he was like completely painted. I think he had like a feather through his nostril or something like that. And she goes, yeah, I asked if I could take a picture of his face paint. And then he pulled from underneath his grass skirt his smartphone and asked me to take one too. <laughs> And I was just like, that just, you know, it shows how how much the world is changing in the sense of technology. Yeah, or um, even one of our friends who works for the Red Cross was talking about how um, for their refugee camps in the Middle East, for Syrian refugees, like one of the most important features is having good charging stations for all the phones and electronics that people have. It's so interesting. Um, I I think it's pretty amazing. Like, I know that there's some people who think that, you know, the progress of cell phones is not such a great thing. But I think that the, like, progression in technology is a really beautiful thing. Like, I know that it's made travel a lot easier, a lot more comfortable, a lot more accessible in a lot of ways. Yeah. And then for people, like, for people who who never really had landline phones because they were growing up in somewhere poor and now they can get a phone with data and be connected on Facebook to people all over the world and like 
be on YouTube and all this other stuff. Like that's just amazing. Yeah. And I think it's cool in like a bigger sense too, because when you can connect yourself to the things that are going on in the world, I think that's when people really start like questioning, questioning things and ideas start spreading, which is like pretty amazing. So one of the other big changes that comes up when I, I start thinking about what travel was like for us five years ago versus today is just how easy it is to get on Wi-Fi now compared to what it was then. Like I remember in Europe, you'd have to buy Wi-Fi at a lot of hostels. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> and which that was totally just like, was a thing. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Asia was like pretty good for free Wi-Fi in 2011. But it kind of sucked. Like yeah, I, the Wi-Fi was shitty. Yeah, I kind of remember like getting to Australia and being like, okay, friends and family, I will talk to you all when I get to Australia. Like I basically, like I don't think I Skyped or anything with anyone in 2011 when we were in Asia. Yeah, and then Australia and New Zealand both had like, um, you have to pay for Wi-Fi things at hostels. Um, but now, like I think here in Kuala Lumpur we did a, a speed test on our Wi-Fi and it was like a hundred megabyte per second down and like 90 megabyte per second up which is like way better than the Wi-Fi we had in Canada yeah <laughs> yeah I was actually FaceTiming with my parents this morning and my mom goes oh it says that there's a poor connection I was like I think that's on your end not my end I have really good Wi-Fi here she's like we have really good Wi-Fi here you're in Malaysia and I was like we have really good Wi-Fi here and I don't see that on my end <laughs> like I didn't have a poor connection on my end it was just happening on hers which is kind of funny because, you know, I remember even in being in Paris the first time around trying to Skype with one of my really good friends and it was just like so atrocious. I was sitting in a hallway of a hostel and I just could not get good internet for the life of me. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes it a lot um, nicer. I know we, um, last week we had an episode with Brock from Backpack with Brock and he was talking about doing his uh starting his travel blog in 2010 which now or travel vlog sorry now video blogging is like com not may not common but like very popular it's like a trendy thing to do and it's very possible to travel around and upload youtube videos but in 2010 like i know we were struggling with just even getting connected to wi-fi but like regularly creating videos and uploading them would have been a nightmare and yeah, he was talking about how he'd like upload them overnight. <laughs> Just like, yeah. oh god. <laughs> yeah, it's funny too because it's like such a short period of time, but that has changed so substantially. Yeah, yeah. And so, what are like the? Oh, sorry, what was your? I was just gonna say it's like massively improved. Like, what's the, like the big impact on like a day to day traveling level? Um. Well, I think that it makes like working abroad much easier. Like that's something that we're currently doing and having good wi-fi is really essential for that and so it makes like it makes having a job when you're on the other side of the world really possible whereas like a couple of years ago like 2011 definitely would have been really really challenging yeah and also just staying connected with the friends like knowing that you can hop on skype and it's gonna work fine makes right it a lot easier right yeah I think that the first time we traveled, I didn't really Skype too much with a ton of people. And like, I still came back and had like a good group of friends and that sort of thing. But it definitely did make it a lot harder to keep in touch. And then in 2014, it was like, I could still iMessage and people could still message me through my phone number. I just would only get it when I was on Wi Fi, um, which wasn't a big deal. But now it's like, people can send me iMessages, they can message me through WhatsApp. I've got Messenger on my phone. Um, I have a phone number attached to my Skype account so I can call and it comes up as a local number. I mean, buying Skype credits is you can spend 15 bucks and you'll have credits that'll last like months and months, even if you're using it regularly. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's incredible what you can do. Yeah. And, and it's also like, it's also kind of got like a few cons to it though. Right. Do you want to talk about those a little bit? Yeah, it's kind of just like we were talking about earlier. It's awesome that you're connected, but part of like the part of traveling that was nice big picture was being disconnected. And I know for us, 
the first two really long back cracking chips are really good for breaking up habits like hopping on a computer and watching a tv show at night like we were kind of forced into reading a lot more and we both came back being like wow um, i feel so much better when i'm reading as opposed to watching shows um or you know you can't get at home it's easy to get sucked on and stuck on youtube for a while whereas you're traveling it kind of breaks that habit same thing with facebook and so when you've got wi-fi and even good data it's you don't have the chance to break those habits because you aren't getting disconnected Right. Yeah. I'm just thinking about, we went to like a nature park, um, yesterday, just a little bit outside of KL and, you know, we took an Uber there. It was really affordable, maybe like $5 for like a 30 minute ride. And then we got an Uber on our way home and it's like, we have data. So you you get in the car, you can just hop on your phone. You do a little bit like dig into your email, check Instagram. If you're me, go onto Facebook, check your notifications. Whereas like a couple of years ago, I would have been forced to look out the window and just take in my surroundings. And I think that that's a big negative to me is like, I have the option to kind of get lost on these things or to go on and like check social media. And it takes like an active like oh I should put my phone away and just like be present in this moment right now it actually takes that active like thought and then taking action with that thought to actually do it whereas like we were kind of forced into it when we didn't have any data yeah I mean you can sit there and like look for a wi-fi to signal to come up but it's like it's not going to I mean that's the downside I think the pro on that side is that there's a little bit less stress involved with the actual like travel like the fact that we have uber so we have data to get uber we get into an uber it's like i can watch where our car is going the entire time and like oftentimes taxis can be a really sketchy thing especially when you're in a developing country yeah there's a lot of taxi scams which uber completely well i think for the most part alleviates a lot of that stress but even if you're feeling stressed that your uber driver is not trustworthy you can watch on google maps exactly where you're going So you can see that they're navigating you, taking you to the right place. Whereas that wasn't really something that we could do ever before traveling. Yeah, I know both in Asia and in South America, um, just dealing with like taxis is just a pain in the ass. Like I remember being in Thailand in 2011 and all the taxis have meters, but no one will run the meter for you. And they all try to charge you like 200 baht. Um, (laughs) And it was like just this pain to try to find a taxi and haggle with them. And then same thing in South America where there you're ha- aware that there are a lot of taxi scams. Like I remember getting to Arequipa and hearing all this stuff about like, oh, only take a certain type of taxi because the other ones like people get like all sorts of shady stuff happening to them in those cabs. Um, but you also just having to worry about negotiating a price before you get in the cab, like don't put your bags in the trunk until you've negotiated a price. Um, Make sure you're clarifying total versus per person because they'll try to charge you per person. Or even dollars. Yeah. I've heard the like, oh, all of a sudden they'll decide like, no, no, I meant US dollars. Yeah. Which can make a massive difference depending on the local currency that you're in. Yeah. And just having that like, oh, okay. It's on the app. No need to worry about that. It's, It's so nice. And it's so much safer too. Right. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting because I feel like maybe like, I don't, I don't know if I want to use mainstream media, but maybe it's mainstream media. I know that there's like some stuff that's come up on like some main news networks that's talking about, you know, oh, like, you know, this Uber driver scammed this person or this and this happened. And I mean, obviously the news has a lot of like downsides in general where they portray like, you know, only the bad things that happen where it's like millions of people are having great Uber rides. But it's interesting to hear about these taxi scams and then to hear about, um, you know, the great things that can happen with Uber. Like, for example, there was a girl at the conference in Manila and she left her cell phone in uh, the Uber car that she took and she gets out and she's like, oh, my God, like I left my cell phone. Um, She's able to get onto like the internet pretty easily. She gets access to call. She calls like Uber. Uber connects her to the driver. She tells the driver she left her cell phone there. He's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'll come bring it to you. And within like a couple minutes, she's got her cell phone back, which is like, that's amazing. That's amazing that somebody can leave their cell phone in an Uber in Manila and that driver 
can get that cell phone back to her. Whereas like, you know, in a lot of places that we've been before, it's like, we're so worried that this person's going to like drive off with our bags before we even get in the car or are going to demand like too much money for us. If I had like left my iPhone in a taxi in anywhere in South America, I would have been like, it's gone. Like there's no way I'm going to get it back. Even if I can get a hold of this person, like they're yeah. going to keep it. Yeah. Trying to call a like Colombian taxi company. Or something. <laughs> It'd just be, it's like a nightmare scenario. Yeah. yeah. And I think like in getting out to developing countries and seeing, seeing these technologies working, like that's where you see like how much more of an impact they have. Uh, like taxis do suck most places in North America, um, but they're not like as unsafe as they are when you go down to South America or Asia. Um, you don't have to worry about as many scams and about you know getting kidnapped and stuff like that right it's like pretty unlikely that a a taxi in like calgary is going to take you to a bank machine and get you to like empty your savings for them with like a gun against your head or something like it's probably just not going to happen you know because it's a pretty safe place (laughs) that shit like happens (laughs) thankfully we've never experienced it um but another like sort of note on that is i think that part of the reason why Uber is such a great service is that it's providing a service for the person who's getting driven, but it's also providing this really great opportunity for the driver to make money. Like I think it gives the opportunity for a lot of people to make a little bit more money and that really helps the economy. It helps like overall happiness. And I think that's part of the reason why drivers are so great and why they're willing to, you know, drive your cell phone back to you if you forget it in the car. Yeah. And Uber drivers, a lot of them are just like normal people doing it for a bit of extra work on the side. Um, so a lot of them are leading interesting lives and you have really good conversations with them in a way that when you, I don't know, it feels like when you hop in a taxi, a lot of the times the taxi driver kind of is very much prefers to just not talk to you. I know there's exceptions to that, but for the most part, um, but e- in an Uber driver, Uber cars, like even over here in Asia so far, we've had like lots of good conversations with drivers um, about things to do and places to see and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. I think, though, it's just important to note quickly, like we're not sponsored by Uber or anything. We just like genuinely really love the service. So I just want to note that. Yeah. And there's all sorts of other ones like I know uh, in Asia, there's one called Grab, which is also popular. So. Yeah, it's more much so that ride sharing technology, not necessarily Uber. Yeah, I mean, Uber is the one we use the most. We use Grab a little bit in Manila, though, and it was just as great. I have just as many good things to say about Grab as I do about Uber. Lyft was amazing in the U.S. Yeah, so we've talked about um, navigation being a big change, transportation. Um, it has been interesting, like, as far as long haul transportation, ha- has there been much of a change in that? tech wise like i know even five years ago we were still using skyscanner it seems like flights are a bit cheaper now most places but um, it's a bit easier to book stuff online but it seems like that hasn't actually changed that much yeah i don't think there's been too too much change in in that regard i think that maybe having like better modes of transportation like it seems like asia is kind of getting more on board with the like luxury bus concept similar to south america yeah i remember being here the first time and taking buses and it was just like crazy i mean our vietnam episode is a good one to listen to if you want to hear about the experiences of atrocious overnight asian buses and mind you we haven't been on an overnight bus since being in asia the first time so i don't think we can speak too much to it but i booked us on a bus the other day and just looking at the bus i was like yeah okay that bus looks nice like way better than any bus we ever took in asia last time which is kind of interesting. But yeah, I don't think anything much has changed with that. Um, And then, so accommodation is also, I think the big change we've experienced like day to day as travelers is just using Airbnb a lot more. Um, Yeah. So we've talked about Airbnb a bunch on the show, so we're not going to like belabor that point. But 
Uh, also not sponsored by Airbnb. Our first Airbnb experience was in 2014, though, in South America. Yeah. Do you know when Airbnb was sort of... Was that when Airbnb was sort of becoming popular? I think it was a couple years before that. Okay. But so I think there's a lot more options. I'm sure that there are more and more options as time goes by, especially like outside of North America. Um And then also cheaper options as well. Yeah. I mean, especially traveling as a couple, Airbnb is such a great option just because you can get like, for example, we're in Kuala Lumpur. We have a bachelor suite apartment that's like really, really good size and it's costing us 40 Canadian dollars a night. And it's like when you look at hostels, you can get a dorm room for... I don't know, between 17 and like 25 a night, which when you times that by two is maybe a little bit cheaper, but also maybe a bit more expensive than the place that we're paying for here. Yeah. So there's like a debate, like hostel Airbnb, the the prices are like close enough. And now that we're like a bit older, like so old, choose to pay for the Airbnb than when we were like 21. But if you look at hostels versus Airbnb, like, or sorry, hotels, not hostels. If you look at hotels, like, there's this is just like a million times better right and yeah. cheaper way bigger we've got a kitchen like there's no way you get a hotel suite for 40 bucks a night in a city like this with like a beautiful infinity pool and a free gym and all that you just wouldn't find that um so i think that in that regard airbnb has definitely like changed the way we travel quite a bit just like giving us more options um I think that it's just nice too, especially on a long-term trip to be able to find somewhere where you can stay for a little bit and have your own space. Mm-hmm. I think that's so key, especially like trying to be digital nomads. Yeah. And it's funny because I think that we were using Hostel World the whole time and Hostel World's a really great way to find good hostels to stay at. But it seems like you're getting better and better hostel options because of that pressure on hostels to be good right like i know when we were traveling here in 2011 there weren't a ton of good hostel options but it seems like most cities that we're going to now do have those yeah yeah there was i remember staying in quite a few guest houses and not having like the most social time the last time we were in asia and i think that that's really changed like um looking at places to stay in singapore like there were hundreds of hostels to choose from i feel like there were so many of them and same in manila like a ton of cool hostels to choose from here there's a bunch of hostels and there's some really popular ones with like really great amenities and facilities amazing ratings um so i think that like bringing in more services and even more like discount hotel options like There's Priceline, there's Booking.com, there's Agoda. Um, There's so many different choices in terms of finding discounted hotels, which kind of also puts pressure on Hostel World. Like, hey, let's be like cheaper and even better. Yeah, it's funny because like you notice, it's easier to notice like big changes, like a service appearing where it wasn't before. So like Airbnb popping up and now you can like find people's apartments to rent easily and affordably. Like that's something you notice is a lot easier to notice but the thing that you don't notice is like the incentives changing and the pressure on hostels to be better or the pressure on airbnbs to be better so that over the course of five years the quality of hostels actually improves because more and more people rely on this service online and there's a strong reputation system and the better hostels rise to the top easier and the worst hostels fall to the bottom easier um And it really improves the overall quality. Yeah, definitely. Just having more options, I think, provides that. Like, the hostels that are doing, like, a really crappy job are probably not going to stay around long term. Yeah, and it's... It'd actually be interesting to go through, like, all the hostels we've ever stayed at and see if any of them have closed down. I feel like we've stayed at some pretty amazing ones, but there's some pretty, like, mediocre ones in there, too. Yeah, and it's funny to think about just how much like the pace of that change happens now versus like if you were traveling in like the eighties or something. Yeah. And it would have been like the main source is a guidebook and like a guidebook comes through and rates a hostel. And then that's going to be like gold for you as a hostel. If you get a good rating in like a Fromer's guide or something, 
um, that's going to be like good for you for like five years. And now same thing with restaurants, but like if you got a guidebook recommending you and you start sucking, that's going to disappear in like a week. Right. Right. I mean, it's not going to disappear from the guidebook, but more people are. Yeah, but people are going to people like are going to cross reference the guidebook to Yelp to TripAdvisor, and if that place or a Hostel World, for example, if you're in a Lonely Planet and people go check you out on Hostel World, and it turns out that six out of the last like fifteen reviews have said negative things, they're probably not going to book with you. Right, and I think though, I mean, Hostel World has provided like up to date booking like up-to-date reviews since we started traveling in 2011 like I would say that that was something that was really key in 2011 like we traveled both 2011 and 2014 with guidebooks this is the first time we haven't had a guidebook and I remember we would like maybe or I would like read through the guidebook see what there was to do in the city look at some of the options for different places to stay different places to eat but even then I always went on hostel world and bo- and looked up their re- like their ratings and reviews before booking yeah um so i think that that's like obviously it's become more prevalent i don't even know like i don't know if other travelers have had the same thing so maybe reach out and let us know sort of if you still travel with a guidebook it's something that we kind of were like oh should we get a guidebook like as sort of a last minute thing and then we're like oh no like lonely planets are great but they're pretty expensive and there's a lot of stuff that you don't really need between like wiki travel other travel bloggers instagram um, like other travel podcasts there's lots of different sources where you can find information about what to do in a city yeah yeah i think the thing that that we're kind of missing from that is like discovering places that might we might not be aware of because like flipping through a country in a guidebook is like a good way to find out about some new places and that's something we've like talked about in the past about how like a lot of guidebooks are very like unopinion uh, unopinionated about so like lonely planet we've kind of been like oh it sounds like ev- you don't go to like whatever a city and find like oh this city actually sucks don't go here <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like that's a good or a bad thing? Like, is that a pro or a con? No, I just feel like it's a con because the service I want is like, where should we really be going? What should we really be doing while we're here? And I think that's still something that's like a little bit hard to find and you still kind of have to rely on word of mouth for because like TripAdvisor is really not that great for that. Um, I think the problem with TripAdvisor is that I mean, maybe like with any review site, but I don't, I feel differently about Hostel World because after each booking, they send you an email and it seems like a lot of people do fill out the reviews. Yeah. Um, But with TripAdvisor, it seems like people, people write in if they have a really great experience or the people write in if they have a bad experience. It seems really rare that people are like, yeah, I had like a fine experience here. This is what it was like. Yeah. And you don't know because people... It's not like a hostel world where people book through hostel world and then review through hostel world. Same thing with Airbnb, same thing with Uber. Um, TripAdvisor, people just submit stuff, so it's easier to hack and have fake ratings. And there's just, it's like everything's kind of lost in this like soup of like four, 4.5 yeah. in the middle. So you can't really pull anything apart. And blogs are really good if you can find like a blog that you really like and you really trust. But if you're going to a new place and haven't been following many blogs, um, it's hard to kind of identify what exactly, you know, what to trust, what are the best things to do, what are the best places to go in a country. Right. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, Do you think that, like, travel books like Lonely Planet will become obsolete at some point? Yeah. Do you think they're on their way out now? I think it's, like, pretty close. Yeah. I think that they still have, like, some value. Like, you can find most of that stuff online. Um, but, like, having this really, like, authority, like, here's a region, like, here are the top things to do there. Here are the top things to do in those individual places there. Um, here are some things to watch out for. Yeah. Like, that's still valuable. I feel like TripAdvisor has, like, taken away some of that stuff 
Hostel World's taken away some of that stuff. Travel blogs have taken away some of that stuff. Um, it just kind of be a different services have picked away at the value of the guidebook. Right. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I saw somebody with a guidebook when we were walking around in KL the other day, and I actually felt like, a, oh, I kind of miss like having that. <laughs> yeah, it is fun, and I feel like we would probably have done more stuff if we had one because it does kind of um, put you into that headspace of like, oh, there's things like I should probably be doing here. Right, and that's the great thing about Lonely Planet is that it's very like with each city and town, it gives you like things to go see, even if it's just like the local cathedral. Which it often is. I feel yeah. like every small town we went to in South America, it's like, okay, and go see the cathedral. And I'm like, I've seen so many cathedrals, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if, if this exists, but, like, it'd be cool to have a really good, I mean, just, like, if you could try, like, a, a good reputation system like TripAdvisor, but that, like, you could actually trust, and that would, like, give you good ratings of like the cathedral but it also includes stuff like the escape room or like right. this like vip movie theater experience or like floating down the river and like you can go and find out like what are like the actual like re- coolest things to do in this town i mean wiki travel kind of has some of that not with ratings though but like if you google things like google always has like they have like a rating review system that seems to be like pretty accurate yeah. Do you feel like that or do you feel like something that's like more? Well, Google, I feel like I still don't trust Google that much. Right. It's still hard because with any rating and review system, it seems like people are mostly writing in if they're really happy or really upset. Like that's the problem with those systems, right? Yeah. Except like something like Uber where it's like quickly right after submit, super simple, something ho- like Hostel World with just a couple questions on some key elements. Super simple. Yeah. So one last point I want to touch on, on kind of the, maybe on the negative side of how travel is changing is um, kind of like the loss of serendipity that you experience when you are super connected. Do you want to explain that a little bit more? Yeah. So just like, since you have your phone on you, a lot of the times we've determined what restaurant we're going to and we leave our building and we take an Uber over there. (laughs) Um, we're not walking around looking for stuff to do and stumbling upon things anymore or like running into people or uh, finding a really cool restaurant that we hadn't found before because we're looking it up online. Like That's not entirely true though. Like I'm thinking about Singapore and how we were just like walking around and we discovered some cool things while going to other places. But don't you see like it, it... I do. Drops as you um, have all the information accessible to you and can go point to point. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. I do think, though, that there's like still some serendipity, but yeah, it takes away a lot of it as like, okay, let's just go like find dinner. And it's like, what do you want to eat? I don't know, whatever like looks good. Yeah, I think it's still there. And, but I, I just think that like kind of like in human nature is like you have this urge to do things that you think you like to do, but there's a bunch of stuff that you would like that you don't think you like to do right now. And travel's always been a great way to kind of introduce you to those things that you actually would like, but you may not know that you like yet. And as it becomes easier and easier and easier to get what you think you want, you maybe don't get introduced as often to the things that you would actually like. And you don't discover as many new things because you can look up, we can find like the... um, healthy whatever restaurant and not like (laughs) stumble into like the sketchy looking malaysian place and actually turns out we really love whatever is there right yeah i think yeah i guess i was gonna like kind of argue for the pros of that is that you don't like end up in situations where you're so hungry that you you were ever and end up getting like food poisoning (laughs) yeah (laughs) i mean there's kind of like pros and cons within that and i think too it's like you can kind of um, choose your own travel experience. Like I know that there's a lot of people who like love the idea of just getting lost in a new city and seeing where the day takes them and discovering like new things, just like we're talking about, like having that like serendipity. 
And I think you can still have that even if you've got technology. It might yeah. just be a matter of making it more of an active choice, an active choice to turn your phone on airplane mode or an active choice to not use your phone to help you get from point A to point B if that's what you want. It definitely like makes it more difficult because you've got like that lifeline there that's sort of there if you need it. But I think it's just like making a choice as to what you want out of your situation. Yeah, it just like puts the responsibility on you. Right, um, instead of not having the choice. Yeah, and because like travel has been a really good way for people to grow because it forces you outside of your comfort zone. Right. And as technology improves, it's easier and easier to stay within your comfort zone. So you just have to choose and kind of take control of getting outside of your comfort zone. And like I think it's there's a ton of awesome stuff about it and I definitely hope it continues and I'm excited to see how technology continues to change with travel um but it does kind of also just put a bit more pressure on you from like uh, getting outside of your comfort zone making sure if you want something more out of your travel experience that you choose to break your habits that you choose to um try to walk around randomly get lost have serendipitous experiences stuff like that right and it's nice to know that you've got your cell phone to like get you back to point a or get you out of a dangerous situation quickly if you do get into it it is nice to like know that you've got that sort of like i, I don't know safety blanket if you will kind of yeah, there absolutely. available for you um so i think that it's like there are pros and cons um we haven't really met anyone so far who's like been traveling pretty pretty like bare bones i guess like rugged sort of old school like it seems like everyone's got technology with them like more and more i'm seeing like people with their laptops i mean people have gopros like there's gopros everywhere i was kind of nervous about bringing a gopro over to asia and like there's tons of like local people with gopros out and about like i think that it's obviously important to be safe with your GoPro or with any technology that you have, because when you let your guard down, that's when, you know, somebody will steal it from you. But at the same time, it seems like there's so many people like flying drones and they have technology that's way more advanced than even mine is, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny to see how things change. And it's funny too being like so young, but still feeling like <laughs> things have changed so much in five years. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to look in five years and see how technology has continued to advance the way that we travel. Yeah, so um, if you want to check out any of the, like, tools we use, we'll have a list of, like, the kind of, like, technology that we use while we're traveling on the show notes on theworldwanderers.com. Um, as always, thanks so much for listening. Do you have anything else to add? I was going to say that if you've never used Uber or Airbnb before, we've got um, promo codes for getting your first like ride free or getting your first stay for like 25 bucks or something free. So you can sign up for those. We've got links that will be on the show notes, and they're also under our resources page. That way you can test them out and see if you love them as much as we do. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanderers.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanderers or on Twitter at World Wanderers 1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye.